Germans were slaughtered. He devised cruel, sadistic punishment in his personal torture chamber. He watched prisoners flayed, boiled, and even fried. Execution, torture were absolutely routine for 16th century Europe. But somehow with Ivan, it goes a little bit beyond standard routines of a, a strict, even brutal ruler. Ivan destroyed villages, towns, and an entire city. He stabbed his son to death in a fit of rage. All in the name of God. In 1533, the death of Vasily III plunged the Russian state into chaos. As Grand Duke of Moscow, he controlled the country and its rival noble families. Ivan, his son and heir, was just three years old on his father's death. Ivan's mother, Elena, fought a desperate battle to be regent. In five years, she was dead, poisoned by the nobility, the boy asked. The young Grand Duke spent his childhood in terror. Armed men stalked the corridors of Ivan's Kremlin palace as rival factions fought for supremacy. Ivan was an emotional wreck. One has to imagine an eight-year-old boy who'd lost his father and, and his, his mother feels that he has been abandoned and, and what he sees all around him are the various boyer factions fighting for power. He had been hungry, cold, um, he had been neglected, um, humiliated. The main emotion was one of, of, of fear that he, he could at any moment be murdered and he must have felt very insecure. And, and historians have spoken of, of paranoia. <laughs> Despite his fears, Ivan escaped unharmed. He started to believe that God was saving him. Starved of human contact, he poured over the Old Testament and historical chronicles, obsessed by the respect and power of past rulers. The Old Testament texts are very bloody. There's a lot of healing and massacring and destroying and so on. And he learned a uh, severe uh, king or tsar has to be strong. Like the word Grozny, the Russian word for him is calling he is strong, and he is severe, and he is brutal. In Christianity, I found identity and purpose. Russians believe that in the 15th century, Russia had become the, the center of, of true Christianity. Orthodoxy was the, the true faith and the ruler of Russia was the protector of orthodoxy. In other words, the, um, the greatest ruler in the world. Ivan's worship was increasingly obsessive. Hanging his head against the floor before religious icons, he developed a cast. It became a lifelong habit. Ivan was also developing sadistic interests. One of his hobbies was to take dogs, cats, bears and, and other small creatures to the top of tall buildings and then throw them to the ground below. Fascinated by torture, he tore the feathers from birds and slit their stomachs. Finally, at the age of 13, Ivan lashed out at the boyars. Leading noble families were invited to Christmas banquet. Ivan turned on them in a furious speech and singled out their leader, Andrei Shuisky. He demanded his immediate execution. Shuisky was dragged out, thrown to hunting dogs, and savaged to death. The murder of Andrei Shuisky was the beginning of his cruel policy, the policy of 
um, physical destruction of his political enemies. And it was a first step on the road to the absolute power, absolute power based on terror. By the age of 16, Ivan was brutalized, paranoid and embittered. Exhilarated by his newly discovered power, now he took steps to boost his authority. In January 1547, Ivan announced his coronation. His father had been called Grand Duke. Ivan demanded to be crowned Tsar, claiming sacred descendancy from the Roman emperors. It placed him above his fellow nobility. This title was not very pleasant for the boyars because most of them realized that it gave him an additional power and a secret power. But they were unable to protest because it was a national dream to have the independent king, to have the Tsar. It was a sort of dream. The boyars accepted, won over by Ivan's next declaration. He would take a Russian bride, chosen a national virgin class. Girls over the age of 12 were paraded in front of him. Ivan chose Anastasia Romanov. The marriage was a happy one for Ivan and to Russia. For a while, his new Tsarina would hold Ivan's cruelty in check. Anastasia loved her husband, and she loved his wife too. Maybe she was the real uh, part of his soul, this, uh, this better half, you say. Within months of his coronation, the new Tsar fell under a second influence. The year had been blighted by a series of fires in Moscow. Thousands died or were left homeless. Ivan saw it as a sign from God, punishment for neglecting his country. In a packed red square, Ivan prostrated himself before his people. The new Tsar promised to protect them in the name of God. His sense of spiritual responsibility was very developed. And then he became a grown-up king. He had this sense of responsibility, you know. That's why uh, when he failed in most of his projects, it was his personal tragedy. Ivan reformed the state, the church, and the army, withdrawing power from the nobility and uniting his country. In the east, he conquered the Muslim city of Kazan, claiming a religious victory. In the west, he opened trade routes with England. Ivan was enjoying a golden age. It was not last. In August 1560, his beloved Anastasia died in mysterious circumstances. She was 27 years old. Ivan went mad with grief, convinced she'd been poisoned, just like his mother. Anastasia's death was really a tragedy, a tragedy for Ivan himself and also the tragedy for the nation, because after her death, there was nobody who was able to stop him in his policy, in his cruel policy. And uh, he uh, decisively uh, changed the course of his policy after her death. Years of repressed anger and hatred erupted as Ivan's old cruelty resurfaced. In the terrible revenge that followed, whole families were wiped out, from elderly women to 12-year-old boys. Many of the nobility had fought loyally in the Tsar's armies. They were tortured and killed alongside their children. Ivan would marry seven more times, but never again find peace. Despite hours in penance, his relationship with God had changed. If God could take Anastasia, he must be cruel and irrational. Ivan ruled in the same way. Ivan the Terrible had pulled Russia together by the force of his will. Throughout his life, Ivan suffered a progressive bone disease. As his spine shrank, he was in agony. Seeking relief, he turned to mercury. It made violent and unpredictable. Uh, Ivan was a man who couldn't keep his composure. He exploded in a moment, did and was brutal, was violent, was everything uh, uh, that Tsar didn't have to do. And then 
A moment later, he was depressive, saw what he has done. Ivan's anger was made more deadly by a long wood staff with a sharp point to wound or kill. But in 1565, the Tsar's surprised decision to abdicate confused and terrified the nation. He blamed unrest among the boyars and the clergy. Ivan's threat was really just a ploy in order to get what he wanted. I very much doubt whether he really intended to abdicate. He gambled on the fact that for Russians, for, for both nobles and townspeople and peasants, the idea of the Tsar as ruled Russia was absolutely central. Despite being feared at every level of society, Ivan was now indispensable. In Russia, we have the choice not between dictatorship and the freedom, but between dictatorship and the chaos. It's a very painful choice. The people saw the chaos in a time of Ivan childhood. That's why they prefer to have a dictator. After an emergency meeting, senior clergy and nobility begged the Tsar to reconsider. Ivan demanded a terrifying price. The absolute power to purge his nation without judgment or criticism from anyone. Claiming authority above the church, Ivan's now the sole interpreter and executor of the will of God. Now, he created his own elite terror force, the Krishniki. He divided Russia in two, one part to be run by the boyars, the other, the richest, was terrorized by these men in black. Some people say that there is a sort of resemblance between Oprichniki and uh, a system of political police in a Soviet time, I mean a system of KGB. Probably some features are common because Oprichniki were a sort of political police. Everything about the Oprichniki was calculated to create fear. Dressed in black, they rode black horses decked out in dogs' heads, symbols of their mission to hunt down the enemy. They carried brooms, symbolizing their intent to sweep them away. Many were criminals, and picked by Ivan for their cruelty. They were like devils. They killed and they raped, and they plundered everything. Ivan selected the most aggressive 300, and installed them in his palace at Alexandrov. With terrible irony, he called it a monastery. The men would be his monks, he would be their abbot. Ivan drew up strict timetable for monastery's activities. At three in the morning, the Tsar rang the bell, summoning the brothers to church. Those who missed the service were punished with prison. For four hours, Ivan would sing, pray, and prostrate himself. After a meal, a short nap, the Tsar visited the dungeons for the afternoon's executions. Here, in his personal torture chamber, Ivan reconstructed hell. He deliberately selected biblical punishments. All the tortures which Ivan carried out, I'm sure in his own mind, had a religious justification. On the other hand, there is, what can one say, purely personal enjoyment of, of, of cruelty, of, of blood, of, of, of pain, of, of, of suffering. And, and I think it's, it's very difficult sometimes to, to reconcile the two. Sometimes, Ivan will lead the sessions, removing ribs with red hot pincers. A witness described how he left beaming with contentment. There is a pattern there. A small boy who enjoyed torturing animals. He was a teenager who set his hounds upon one of his boys, and, and so on. Um, if you follow through the, these uh, moments of, of, of excess, then it's really not uh, too surprising to end up with the religious ceremonies and then, then the, the torture sessions, the, the orgies of Alexandra. 
Often, in the evening, his men would bring in peasant girls. There was no religious justification for either's treatment of them. They were whipped, raped, and used for target practice. But the nobility suffered in the greatest numbers. Up to 10,000 died at the hands of Ivan's Spirit Police. Many more were forcibly relocated, their lands seized and settled by the Oprichniki themselves. Few dared to challenge his rule. The head of the Russian Orthodox Church begged for mercy for men unjustly accused of rebellion. He was charged with sorcery, imprisoned and murdered. Ivan was merciless with opposition. Hearing rumors that the city of Novgorod was planning a rebellion, Ivan decided to punish the entire population. In a five-week orgy of violence, Ivan oversaw the torture of more than 15,000 people. With his 15-year-old son by his side, Ivan devised punishments for those brought before him. Perhaps the, the most uh, intriguing was the use of giant fry pans in which the, the victims were slowly fried, or, or in some cases boiled in, in large pots, in order to extract their confession, because it was incidentally important that people should confess to their sins before they were, were then murdered. Sometimes the Tsar joined in. A German mercenary wrote of Ivan's behavior in the city. Mounting a horse and brandishing a spear, he charged and ran people through while his son watched the entertainment. Ivan himself was there. He witnessed the, the tortures and, and seemed delight in them. And so I think one has to say that in the case of, of the matter of Novgorod, this is a, an, an evil man indulging his, uh, his, his sadistic tendencies. Men, women and children were tortured and mutilated. They were tied to slaves and driven into the Volkov River. Moscow did not escape either. Ivan was convinced of a wide-scale conspiracy and ordered mass trial. He suspected that a lot of people in Moscow, in Moscow were connected with uh, Novgorod Bayars and Novgorod uh, representatives and uh, condemned his uh, activity in Novgorod. Executions were carried out in Red Square. Beneath the domes of Ivan's brand new cathedral, workmen began preparations. They erected 17 gallows and enormous cauldron. Terrified Moscovites were rounded up to witness a gruesome bloodbath. 300 people were executed uh, in one day, among them eminent uh, and famous uh, people of uh, Russian uh, army, Russian uh, state apparatus, uh, and so on. All of them were um, eliminated. One former advisor was hanged by his feet, while Ivan and his men took turns to hack off pieces of flesh. And it was a very somber uh, page in uh, the history of Russia. Even Ivan's family were not safe. In a violent quarrel with his favorite son and heir, Ivan struck out with his staff, kissing the prince's skull. He died several days later. Fyodor, the new heir, was both in... Thousands were slaughtered. He devised cruel, sadistic punishments in his personal torture chamber. He watched prisoners flayed, boiled, and even fried. Execution, torture were absolutely routine in 16th century Europe. But somehow, with Ivan, it goes a little bit beyond standard routines of a, a strict, even brutal ruler. Ivan destroyed villages, towns, and an entire city. He stabbed his son to death in a fit rage. 
all in the name of God. In 1533, the death of Vasily III plunged the Russian state into chaos. As Grand Duke of Moscow, he controlled the country and its rival no families. Ivan, his son and heir, was just three years old his father's death. Ivan's mother, Elena, fought a desperate battle to reach it. In five years, she was dead. Poisoned by the nobility, the boy asked. The young Grand Duke spent his childhood in terror. Armed men stalked corridors of Ivan's Kremlin palace as rival factions fought for supremacy. Ivan was an emotional wreck. One has to imagine an eight-year-old boy who had lost his father and, and then his, his mother feels that he has been abandoned and, and what he sees all around him are the various boyer factions fighting for power. He's been hungry, cold, um, he had been neglected, um, humiliated. The main emotion was, was one of, of, of fear, that he, he could at any moment be murdered and not have felt very insecure. And, and historians have spoken of, of paranoia. <laughs> Despite his fears, Ivan escaped a heart. He started to believe that God was saving him. Starved of human contact, he poured over the Old Testament and historical chronicles, obsessed by the respect and power of past rulers. The Old Testament texts are very bloody. There's a lot of killing and massacring and destroying and so on. And he learned a uh, severe uh, king or tsar has to be strong. Like the word Grozny, the Russian word for him is falling. He is strong and he is severe and he is brutal. In Christianity, Ivan found identity and purpose. The Russians believed that in the 15th century, Russia had become the, the center of true Christianity. Orthodoxy was the, the true faith. And the ruler of Russia was the protector of orthodoxy. In other words, the, um, the greatest ruler in the, the world. Ivan's worship was increasingly obsessive. Banging his head. <laughs>